So, hello and welcome to episode six of our <laughs> STEM six? speak. It is six. Episode oh, wow. six wow. of our STEM speaker series. Um, today, we are lucky enough to be joined by our very special guest, Dr. Cavallaro. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. Um, so, Dr. Cavallaro, um, can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you are doing now, actually? Yeah, sure. Um, so about a year ago, I was hired as the pest abatement manager and uh, lead entomologist for the pest abatement district in Bullhead City. Um, right now, um, I am a one-man wrecking crew for the mosquito and black fly control efforts uh, in the city. And then I also uh, head up the caddis fly research um, kind of activities that uh, we're doing here. Um, Bullhead City is in, in a unique scenario where we uh, get hit from a bunch of different pest aquatic insects, um, and it has a long history, uh, actually decades long history, of uh, trying to fight those uh, various pests. Um, so most of the research that uh, I'm doing right now is looking at different control methods for this new insect that's taken a foothold and kind of uh, plagued the community for the last five years, um, called the net spinning caddis fly, and these are uh, aquatic insects that are similar to kind of um, moths and butterflies and things like that, but their larval stage is underwater and they collect food by casting these large silk nets where they collect uh, food particles. Um, and then they emerge in massive uh, numbers in the spring and in, in the fall. And I'm talking millions, millions of caddis flies that kind of cake on the sides of houses, um, you know, the casinos that are nearby here, the parks, um, they don't sting, they don't bite, um, but they are considered a nuisance insect because of the mental anguish they, they cause, you know, fishermen, riverfront uh, residents, um, and other tourists that come to the area. And all of those things are a critical part of Bullhead City's local economy. Doctor, can we just put more trout in the waters to eat these cats? <laughs> Funny you say that. I, uh, in coordination with uh, Arizona Game and Fish and our local hatchery, we stocked over 25,000 trout over the last two weeks into the river. Um, and some of my colleagues and I with, um, at the U.S. Um, Geological Survey Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center, we did some kind of back of the envelope uh, bioenergetic calculations to see how many trout would actually be necessary to put in the sure. river to put a dent in the caddis fly population. And um, rough calculation, we would need about 25 to 30,000 trout actively feeding every day during the entire emergence event. And they only would have to be eating caddis flies. So um, not, not mayflies, not black flies, not other kind of insects that would, um, that would also be uh, in ideal prey targets, just caddis flies. So they, do those other insects emerge at the same time? Uh, yeah, so we have a couple of insects that will actually have overlap, what we call overlapping phenologies. So a phenology yeah. is the activity pattern. Caddis right. flies will, uh, will have an overlapping phenology with uh, black flies and different types of mayflies as well. Uh, we get a bunch of different mayfly hatches, um, and I actually think that they may be more preferential to the rainbow trout. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different competing food resources where which makes um, just biological control really, really challenging. Now, how long, how long um, have these caddisflies been in the area? So um, that's kind of an interesting question. They've been moving up the Colorado River watershed over the last probably about 40 years or so. Okay. Um, and they've likely always existed here in some kind of a capacity where um, it came into a, a kind of a nuisance problem about five years ago is when they started to really get a handle on the black fly problem in the river where we have a specific larvicide that targets just black flies. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of reduced their numbers over time. Uh, unfortunately, these caddis flies will fill the same niche as these black flies. Sure. So since they opened up a bunch of real estate by taking care of the black flies, all these net spinning caddis flies moved in in their place. Um, we are located about uh, five miles down river of the Davis Dam. And what dams, large hydropower dams do over time 
is deplete the river system with um, depleted from of sediment. They'll they'll channelize the river. They'll make it colder. Um, and basically, they've created over time this Goldilocks zone for this specific insect. So um, there are a number of other environmental factors that kind of went into this um, monoculture or, or single culture of insects being, you know, to nuisance levels. But um, it's likely a combination of them migrating up from Mexico and finding this, you know, this sweet spot to uh, um, kind of have this um, intense, you know, emergence events every year. Mike, you had mentioned earlier that you use the word entomology or that you're an entomologist for, I mean, most of us have probably gathered what that means based off of what you've been talking about so far, but for those of us who don't know, can you explain a little bit um, about what it means to be an entomologist and maybe how you got into it, what, you know, what your um, like, co like college career or schooling looked like in order to be, become an entomologist? Yeah, sure. So um, entomology is the study of insects. Um, in some kind of loose capacities, um, some entomologists will also study uh, ticks, or spiders, even though they're not technically uh, six-legged critters, six-legged crit uh, critters. Um, and as an entomologist, you have kind of um, a different uh, suite of um, career options, because we have um, things like medical entomology, which is studying mosquitoes and black flies, bed bugs, cockroaches, things like that. You have uh, agricultural entomology, more of a pest related that has associated with um, you know, row crops like corn and soybean. Uh, you have uh, conservation. You can look at different endangered uh, insect species, which I did for uh, a number of years. So things like um, either the monarch butterfly, different beetle species, and looking at you know careers of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and uh, one uh, career option that's been kind of gaining steam over the last couple of years is something called entomophagy, which is the um, consumption of insects. So looking at different um, uh, kind of uh, industries that would promote uh, insect farming for whether it be livestock feed, uh, fish feed, human consumption, things like that. So there's a whole bunch of things that as an entomologist you have at your disposal, um, which is really exciting when you get into the field, but also kind of overwhelming because you can, you know, you, uh, deep down you, you know, you, you want to study bugs in some capacity because that's kind of where your passion is. Um, but sometimes the, um, the jobs are either really competitive or um, like I said, just kind of too much, too much diversity in what you can actually do. Um, so when I kind of entered uh, academia or entered my college career, I knew that I wanted to work outside. I've always been a naturalist at heart. Like I said earlier, I'm an Eagle Scout. I was outside all the time, camping, flipping over rocks, you know, jumping into swamps, all that good stuff. Um, so when I entered school, I was like um, overwhelmed with either, you know, looking looking at whether it's botany or ornithology, you know, study of plants, study of birds, mammalogy, study of uh, mammals, looking at all these different ologies that I could be. Um, and I was really fortunate as an undergrad student to have uh, my entomology professor as my main advisor. And um, he taught me how to think like a bug, essentially. And he kind of took me under his wing, showed me um, different career paths, uh, gave me the roadmap to kind of success as an entomologist, uh, introduced me to a lot of the other faculty that had worked with insects before. And this kind of laid the groundwork for me to kind of seriously look at um, what uh, paths were ahead of me and which ones I could take and, um, you know, which ones would, um, you know, make me happy and fulfilled in my career. So um, I kind of went the cold emailing route when I uh, finally um, obtained my undergrad degree and wanted to move on to a master's. Um, and landed a, a position at the University of Nebraska, where I studied an endemic caddisfly species that was being listed or as a potential listed candidate for uh, federal protection. So is this species an endangered species, essentially, was the question that was given to me. Um, and as a, as a master's student, I looked at different population genetics. So looking at the genetic diversity in different populations in the state looked at uh, different predator and prey relationships. So are invasive fish causing the, the, the decline of this insect? Are uh, other fishes um, pr uh, promoting or protecting this insect from other predators? Um, looked at invasive plants that may be uh, disrupting its habitat. Um, 
and a couple of other uh, different physiology questions looking at the, um, the, the makeup of the insect itself. And basically just doing a whole suite of research questions that added up to this report, which I delivered to the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, that either would say, you know, the evidence shows that this insect needs protection or the evidence uh, shows that this insect population is secure as is. Um, and the, the findings were that it was secure enough. So uh, after that, I wanted to continue school and you know, pursue other research questions. So I found my position at the um, University of Saskatchewan where I um, did a PhD in aquatic ecotoxicology. Again, that was cold emailing, looking for a position, looking for people who had funding, um, looking for different projects that they have funding for and what interests me the most. Um, and this new topic of eco, um, aquatic ecotoxicology was looking at so different toxins in the environment. So eco being you know ecology, the environment, study of the interactions in the environment, and then toxicology looking at the uh, impacts of toxicants, contaminants, pollution, whatever um, kind of broad term you want to use that would impact uh, the environment. So um, during my PhD, I looked at the impacts of um, insecticide runoff into wetlands and streams. So this is uh, compounds that we apply to different agricultural uh, crops, um, things like canola, corn, soybean, and um, those uh, different compounds are targeted for those um, pests that will, um, will, will eat corn, soy, soybean, things like that. Uh, but so the residual compound will run off into wetlands and, and streams. So what what happens to aquatic insects when that happens? So, uh, is, what this, are, is this Roundup Ready seeds and stuff like that? Yeah. So, what um, a lot of the products now that we actually plant are uh, seed coated. So they come with uh, a different kind of cocktail of systemic insecticides, right? Um, surfactants, which make it more dissolvable uh, and easier to t for the plant to take up different fungicides that'll uh, impact different um, fungi that will um, cause different plant diseases. Um, most of the herbicides that we apply aren't uh, systemic. They're uh, kind of uh, topical. So you'll see those big sprayers, those booms that come out at certain times to kill down the, the weeds. And the specific insecticide that I worked on uh, was called neonicotinoid insecticide. So this is the compound that we're worried about with honeybees for a while. Um, bumblebees as well, all, all kind of pollinators. So my lab um, looked at the impacts of aquatic insects. And um, it was actually a great timing because that was when uh, the US EPA was looking to um, look at new benchmarks for, this, for these compounds. Uh, Health Canada was looking to do the same thing and the European Union was doing the same thing. So our lab was featured in different CBC radio uh, broadcasts, uh, magazines. We were in a documentary. Um, we've, you know, we published a lot of our research in different um, kind of gray literature, websites, newspapers, things like that. And then I was also fortunate enough to have the um, uh, ability to publish kind of peer-reviewed um, articles that went to these different regulatory agencies that then impacted those policies. So where did where'd the grant money come from? So that grant money was uh, Health Canada and the mm. PMRA, okay. the P uh, Pesticide Management Regulatory Agency, which is okay. the um, agency under Health Canada. Um, so, so it wasn't like Dow, right? No, no. Uh, however, um, yeah, so that's a, it's a, interesting you bring up the, the private sector because the private sector does generate a lot of data uh, yeah. on these uh, specific compounds, but the, um, the transparency isn't always there. Right. And um, the relationship between the private sector and um, federal agencies isn't always as um, free, well, like free, kind of free flowing as um, you would think. So mm -hmm. what was really nice about our kind of, you, want, you can call it third party or tri-party kind of project is that we did involve uh, Syngenta and, and Bayer they, um, they gave us some product to be able to use uh, for testing and lab and our, my lab experiments. Um, and um, they were uh, big proponents of what we were, what we were doing. Cause they, uh, the folks that we worked with really wanted transparency. It's, um, it's kind of tough sometimes with the timing of all of this, that um, when they become as transparent or as willing to collaborate, um, a lot of these compounds have been around for over a decade. So. Sure. Um, as far as the environmental impact that it may have already had, um, 
you know, it's, it's tough to be able to, to uh, quantify that without the, the data, really. So um, that project was really great. Uh, a lot of impact uh, in North America and the EU. Um, and uh, I wasn't done. I really wanted to continue my um, research kind of aspirations in the academic realm. So I, I pursued a postdoc appointment at Oregon State University where I looked at um, water contamination, but this time with uh, a metal called cobalt. So cobalt metal um, is mined for, you know, uh, different battery technologies, different electronics, cathode materials. Um, it's used in different uh, kind of ignition um, compounds for petroleum products. Um, and the Cobalt Institute, which is a metals consortium in the UK, funded this, uh, this research that I worked on in Oregon to look at different thresholds that would be safe in the aquatic environment. This time, not just bugs, but it was uh, um, different aquatic plants, uh, fish, um, crustaceans. And then we also looked at the fate of cobalt in the environment. So is it being taken up in the sediment? Is it being taken up by algae, plants? Uh, is it bioaccumulating in insects and fish? Um, so that was a, about a, a year long uh, project where we delivered uh, data to the Cobalt Institute as a report. And um, we also um, gave uh, our, our data reports to the US EPA and the governing bodies in the, in the EU. So again, this is a data set that was generated to be used in, in action in policy. So to have, um, you know, a benchmark that we could set that this is a safe threshold for cobalt in the environment. Um, and if we breach that threshold is where we see kind of ecological uh, negative impacts from, from contamination. So all of that <laughs> kind of led to um, also uh, kind of some stints working with mosquitoes and black flies along the way with different collaborators and ultimately landed me in Bullhead City. Um, with fine all, place. A fine place, yeah. <laughs> Um, do, do you fish? I do, yeah. Is it a good place to fish? It is. Um, yeah, now uh, that you just stocked, what, 25,000 yeah. trout, right? I mean, like, it's a great place. Yeah. I, it's, <laughs> you give me a call right before you do that so I can go up right, there. The right, day yeah. you, you sound like a lot of the, uh, the folks that give me, a, give me a call when they see the truck out there um, sure. stocking. Yeah. Um, it's really tough. Sometimes I actually will ask people if they could hold off on trout fishing for about two weeks just to give them a chance to do their work. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the trout that we stock are, you know, sub seven inches, which isn't exactly a yeah, right. trophy fish. Um, and we do have uh, striped bass trophy fishing in the. Oh, wow. So um, the, uh, the striper fishing is great. Um, unfortunately, because I think they eat a lot of our trout, but. Um, there is another project that I'm working on with uh, Coast Guard, Army Corps of Engineers, and Arizona Game and Fish to install artificial fish habitat, uh, kind of like those big um, concrete spheres they put in for reef reconstru uh, reconstruction. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So we're putting smaller versions of that in the Colorado River to give wow. our to give our tra uh, trout uh, a, fight a fighting chance against uh, striped bass. Cool. Uh, and uh, cormorants as well. Cormorant uh, birds are really, really uh, mm. voracious fish. So, so, doctor, tell me, you told us about your whole journey, and that's been really absolutely wonderful to hear. Where, where do you see your future? Like, where, where do you see your position going? You talked about um, food for, you know, insects for food. I'm not sure you'd really talk. Are you talking about chapulines? Or, you know, like the, the Mexican crickets that they eat? They love to... They'd love to eat those. Where, where does this lead? 10 years from now, what, what are we going to be talking about? Um, yeah, I mean, as far as from a career point of view, um, it's interesting to kind of uh, forecast out uh, beyond your kind of regimented degrees. Like, okay, three years I, I did my undergrad, two years I had my master's, four years for my PhD, year postdoc. So then beyond that, in like the, in the, in the workforce, essentially, it, it's, um, it's interesting to um, try to see yourself in a position where you, um, for a long time, had these kind of set timelines based on research projects. You know, been, it's almost been project driven. Whereas right now, I have kind of the, uh, the option, um, kind of a lot of low-hanging fruit, really, for short-term research goals and long-term research uh, goals. 
so um, for my position right now, I've kind of worked off of um, kind of a year, year goals and then five-year goals. Um, but uh, beyond that, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, tough because I, I do hope to be able to solve their problem here. <laughs> and I don't yeah. know um, beyond uh, that if I can give them, you know, some kind of a management strategy. Um, as, as academics, we're always kind of looking for what's the next research question. So um, it'll likely lead me back into the academic realm um, just because of that, you know, what's the next challenge, what's, what's next kind of, what kind of um, research questions are out there that haven't been answered yet. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of my, where my headspace is at as far as um, where I can see myself. Um, for um, some of the like insects as food stuff, which is really interesting, you know, it's often compared to um, the, the sushi kind of, uh, evolution over time. If you talk to folks back in the 90s, eating raw fish was was strange, you know, in North America. That was not mm. something that someone did commonly. It was, uh, you know, a lot of Asian cultures did that and um, brought it here. And over time, people were like, okay, I can get into this. And now, you know, all over the place, sushi is the big thing. Um, so I don't know if um, it'll be as seamless as sushi. I don't know if I could <laughs> Can, I don't know if uh, I, I don't know if I'm that good of a salesman to be able to pitch um, cricket sushi or uh, whatever alternative <laughs> version that would be, um, but um, there are a lot of really interesting uh, programs out there that are looking at um, not only mass harvesting of things like crickets or soldier flies, but looking at different diverse kind of food resources. Um, for example, the um, giant Asian hornet that was recently hit the, yeah. you know, hit the news that it's in Washington State, Vancouver Island. Yeah. Um, in Japan, their larval uh, stage and their pupa are considered a, de a delicacy, hmm. uh, which is an interesting kind of niche thing that, you know, you can't mass produce these hornets. And I, I don't know if you would want to. <laughs> yeah. um, I wouldn't want, want that job. But um, if you had some kind of a uh, cultural significance to it, like they do in Japan, then, you know, that's another alternative food source. Um, this is big you know, too, aren't they? They're like they're they're, they're two they're inches. Like the size of your thumb. They're yeah. they're they're, they're uh, stingers about a quarter of an inch, um, <sighs> and um, they actually they they really want nothing to do with us. They're kind of like the tarantula hawks that we have out here in the desert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, unless you mess with them, they're not going to mess with you. Mm -hmm. um, and they're I I think right now they're a little misunderstood, especially with giving them the name murder hornet which is not what they call them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, no, the, it, that's, I guess, one example of how you can uh, tie in like the kind of cultural significance of consuming certain types of insects and what that actually will mean over time um, and how it doesn't necessarily sync up to the North American model right now where mm -hmm. people are just making cricket farms and sure. sort of farms and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see where we go. Um, I think it will play a role, but it's um, kind of uh, known right now. Well, I'm wondering if maybe you have any words of advice for people interested in your field. Yeah, um, cold emailing. I did so much um, with people that I never would have met just by shooting them an email and telling them who I was, um, what I was interested in doing, um, the overlap and in interest, whether it was research or their work or whatever. Um, I was reading and making uh, connections like that. Even right now, um, for example, my project with um, the Coast Guard, Army Corps, Arizona Game and Fish, I knew none of those folks. I, I reached out to them, told them what I was interested in, the project that I wanted to do, and now they're all collaborators. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, when I was you know, a, a pupating entomologist going through the early stages of my career, um, I got my master's position just because I emailed the, the professor at University of Nebraska, saw what research he was doing. It was interesting to me. Um, and we wrote a grant together and got funding, and I was off to Nebraska for two years. So that's, a, um, that's excellent advice. Fantastic, it, doctor. Yeah. Thank and you so from much. there, it, it just leads even more to more networking. Um, and, you know, region, whether it's regional conferences or um, local kind of, um, whether it's um, local government agencies, whether county or state, um, hey, I'm interested in, you know, pesticides in the environment, you know, California Department of Pesticide Regulation, 
are you guys doing any field work nearby? I'd love to learn what you do. Something like that. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it sounds simple, but um, it, it's, it really does make a difference. And a lot of uh, people are really uh, receptive to that. I mean, for example, if somebody emailed me about working with caddisflies here in Bullhead, I'd be very excited to, to teach them about, you know, what I was up to and how they could help and um, what I could do to kind of um, give them some advice on, you know, what's next career-wise or something. So, yeah. Excellent. Scientists don't bite. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we appreciate, <laughs> we appreciate this so much. Thanks for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you to Dr. Cavallero. He's been Yay. such a pleasure to listen to. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Doug.